Hello world, this is CS50 on Twitch. My name is David Malin and I'm here with CS50's own Colton Ogden. Thanks for joining everybody. See us 50 on Twitch. Indeed. Really happy to be back here. Thank you so much for the invitation. The Master Jedi. Yes, so I hear. Nice to see everyone in the chat here already. We were watching as everyone was saying hello to each other too, just a bit ago. Let me pull up the, the Twitch chat here just a second. I can see it over there. Let me actually scroll up. We have quite a few messages that we didn't uh, quite read off just yet, but a lot of people in the chat already. Yeah, Bob Knight, uh, he and I are now uh, BFFs on Facebook, so oh, nice yeah. to see you in the chat again. He uh, deemed you the Master Yoda. Oh, I see. He Thank you. you. M. Kloppenberg, looking forward to this one. Bella Cures, uh, another oh, Real Curious Kiwi, that's Brenda. She's started joining it us. It is. On, Brenda uh, from New Zealand. Yeah, Brenda, what time is it there back home in New Zealand? I reload the page and the entire chat disappeared. Guess that's how Twitch works. Yes, yeah, you'd have to go back to the actual video, scrub backwards, and it'll replay the chat for you at, at that moment in time, which is a feature or a bug, depending mm -hmm. on how you look at it, I suppose. Um, yeah, we've got a bunch of people. TZ Zach is a, is a new person, I think, with the, uh, what is that, the dog sensor flex mm -hmm. uh, emoji. I'm not actually sure which one that is. Music's pretty loud. We changed the audio a little bit. It should sound a little bit better for our, our, our voices. I realize now the music might have sounded a little bit louder mm -hmm. as a result of that. Um, but yeah, thanks everybody for, for joining us. So what are, we, uh, what are we talking about today? So today Colton asked me here to talk about regular expressions, which is a topic that in CS50, the uh, open courseware course and on edX and here on campus that we don't really spend time on, even though there's definitely some opportunities. So I thought we would introduce them as a solution to problems that you can perhaps tee up for us. Yeah, and, uh, and you uh, were my first intro to regular expressions, actually. I think for some scripts you needed me to do stuff. And, uh, oh, look like, at that, coming full circle. It is a regular, this is a thing called a regular expression. Uh -huh. you know, use it and I was like I don't know what a regular expression is but you know here we are how about now uh, to, to a degree uh -huh. Irene, Irene is here she says hi David and Colton and hi everybody nice to see you Irene and uh, Brenda 9 a.m. in New Zealand <laughs> tomorrow apparently so you're a day ahead of us oh and uh, Minter 27 finally I caught you from the start Alex uh, Gabrielov sup from Russia uh, wow nice to see you Alex all the way here from uh, Cambridge Massachusetts people all over the place and of course Andre Andre was actually here when I was testing audio Andre keeps asking the hard questions so we're gonna take questions maybe at the end Andre. <laughs> uh, if you want, I can, I can bring you in if you want to, maybe we can start. Uh, people feel free to definitely contribute questions. Um, but we don't really have to, to say as much. People are, uh, people have lots of questions typically. All programmers and Babic Knight. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll get started and if people have questions, maybe they can contribute. Oh, yeah, by the way, absolutely. new feature, we have the uh, people that so now follow us. Uh, nice. Something we introduced yesterday. Uh, the chat looks, uh, is going to have this gray theme, but the follower theme is kind of in the middle and a little bit more transparent. Um, but Buimik7 has now followed us, so thank you very much for Buimik7. Nice. Follow. Nice little animation there. Um, sorry, what I was saying is I'll, I'll cut us in here so we ha I have your screen if you want to maybe start us off and then if people have questions they can um, they can provide it to us in the chat. Sure. So it sounds like you had a good teacher all those years ago who introduced uh, yeah. you to regular expressions. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. What are regular expressions then? Uh, I would describe regular expressions as a way of matching patterns in text. So mm -hmm. being able to specify characters that can either be specific or generic for a class of characters, um, defining what's called a grammar. And I'll, although I don't know the super deep details on um, you know formal grammar definitions and whatnot, but I know that it is a grammar. Uh, computer languages, parsers, typically use what are called grammars to verify that you're using um, the correct uh, semantic details that define what C is, what Python is, et cetera, and extract symbols out of mm -hmm. your text. And you can do the same thing with regular expressions. That's, I guess, how I think of regular expressions. Yeah, absolutely. I think and a lot of the validation that you might be doing in any web programming that you've done, or if you've taken CS50 when we do a di bit of this in Python and JavaScript, you might just be in the habit of checking things for equality or maybe emptiness. So if the user did not type something in, their input might be empty or null or the empty string, depending on the language. Um, otherwise, there's a value there, which might pass validation. But there's so many opportunities to actually check. Did the user give you what you wanted them to give you? For instance, did they type in an actual email address that has an at sign and a username and a domain name? Uh, did they type in a phone number in a specific format that you care about? And so many other ways where you care not just about the presence of a string, but what it is formatted as. And even more powerfully, suppose that someone does type in, for instance, a, um, a phone number, but some people here in the US use parentheses, some people use hyphens, some people might use a plus and an area code. There's so many different ways you might type in a number. You can actually clean those up pretty readily using regular expressions. Yeah, indeed. Um, and I know that's a, a, an example that's typically, I think, seen would be like an email address. And you know, something that's a simple identifier of what an email address is is usually that at symbol, right? And mm -hmm. normally, a naive approach would be inspecting every character in a string if you're in C or in Python and saying mm -hmm. if 
character is equal to at, well, then I can kind of guess that maybe this is a, a, an email address. But what if that's, for example, the first character? Then clearly that would be an invalid email address. Mm -hmm. Or the last character, that would be an invalid email address. So that approach, that naive approach can be very sloppy and prone to a lot of, I think, errors. Yeah, absolutely. And now, uh, Minter27, I see your green screen is a bit messed up. I think this is actually by design. You're hopefully seeing a white border around the bottom and the side and then a big black box. That's actually my black terminal window. So if that's what you're seeing, that's intentional. We're going to start typing in the terminal window soon. Yeah. And then we got uh, M. Goodow says hi from Denmark. Hello from Cambridge, Massachusetts. All right, so shall we dive in? Thought we would start with Python, which is a language familiar to some folks, especially if you've been tuning into the stream lately. I'm going to go ahead and just open up, for instance, a, a hello.py program. I happen to be using Vim, which is a command line text editor, similar in spirit to the more graphical Atom or VS Code or other such tools these days. Um, and this will just allow me to stay within my terminal window environment. But you can follow along with any text editor if you'd like. Um, and let's just do some Something simple in Python. So for instance, if I want to get a user's name, I might say something like name equals input and then just prompt them for their name using Python's built-in input mechanism. For those of you who've been following along with CS50, you might know this function as get string, which actually does a bit more error checking, but the idea is exactly the same. And then let's just keep it simple and say something like print, uh, for instance, uh, hello, and then print out the person's name. So no regular expressions yet, no conditions, no fancy Let's just make sure we're getting the uh, into the the momentum of actually writing a program in Python. And shout outs to FDC227. Thank you for the follow as well. Wow, nice to see you as well. So let me go ahead and just run this Python of hello.py. Uh, I'm technically going to use Python 3, the latest version, so let me be ever so specific there. It's asking me for my name, so I'll go ahead and type in Colton. And there we have it, hello.colton. Now, if I run this program again, which I can do by hitting up in my terminal Windows history, which you might know from a Linux or a Mac computer or uh, Windows 10. I can play this game again and type in my name David and then here for instance we might type in Brenda our friend in New Zealand and now we have a program that's very dynamic. But suppose that we're not such fans of Colton and we don't want him to be able to participate in this and we don't want to say hello Colton if, if Colton is tuning in. So how might we do this? Well. Let's go ahead and back into the program. Uh, again, that program was called VI or Vim. And here's the program at hand. And let me start to add some conditional logic. So for instance, I might say something like, well, if name equals equals Colton, well, why don't we kind of mess around here and say something like goodbye <laughs> instead of the uh, hello. Otherwise, we can go ahead and print out the name as we intend. So still no regular expressions, just using string comparisons now with Python's equality operator, equal equal. And now let me go ahead and run Python 3 of hello.py. And now I'll go ahead and run that. David will go ahead and play along. Very nice and polite. Brenda, very nice and polite. Now we go ahead and type in Colton and ooh, goodbye Colton. So not all that polite anymore, but we've just checked for the presence of Colton. So this is all fine and good, but suppose I do this. Huh, I did that quickly, but it actually seemed to work this time. I went ahead and just typed in Colton. Now you can perhaps see it a bit more. Notice here that I'm still greeting you, even though you are Colton. That very first one, did you put a space as well? I did. I secretly put it at the end of the string. Ah, uh, OK. I, did, I missed that part. OK. Indeed. So I did that really fast. But you'll notice that unless Colton's name is exactly C-O-L-T-O-N, it's not actually going to match. So how can we tolerate this? Well, Python actually allows us some ways to do this. If I go into Python, uh, into hello.py again, I could be a little more uh, dynamic, and I could say something like if Colton in name, okay. which will search for a substring of uh, the original string, look for Colton as a substring of the variable in name. Now let me go ahead and run this. So let me go ahead and run Python 3 of hello.py, and I'll go ahead now and type in Colton. Still works. Space, 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 space. Colton still works. More subtle. Colton space still works, but better yet, Colton Ogden also still works. OK, so you catch all instances of me. I can catch all instances of Colton. Of course, it does, I don't know. <laughs> 
uh, Colton Oscopy is Colton's favorite username here, but it will also catch that. Spelled it wrong, by the way. Colton Scopy. Okay, so well, let's be precise with your name. Colton Oscopy. That too is going to get caught. Why? Uh, because it has my name in it. It's just a substring of the total name that you have there. So just those first six characters. Yeah, so it's getting a little constrained as to how we might want to express. It's getting a little constrained as to how it's behaving, and we might want to start expressing ourselves a bit more explicitly. Explicitly. Or, you know, what if what if we wanted to do something else altogether? What if I go ahead and type in my full name, David Malin, and I just want it to print out, hello, David? Right, just the first name. Yeah, so now things are getting a little more interesting, and here's an opportunity just to use regular expressions. Now, we don't have to, and let's make sure we make clear the different ways in which you can solve problems. So if a human types in David space Malin, and all you want to say to them is, hello, David, like, how do you think about solving this problem? Um, well, I think a somewhat naive approach would be look for the first space. Okay, so we could look for the first space. So let's try this. Let me go into uh, hello.py again. And let's go ahead and get rid of this and just start the story from when we've gotten the user's name. So if we want to split on the space, how could we do this? Like in C, as you alluded to earlier, oh my god, you could do this so tediously, iterate over every character in right. the string, and then actually look for the space and print it out. So let's do that for C in name. Uh, if C equals equals a space, mm -hmm. then we can go ahead and break perhaps. Else we can go ahead and print out, uh, for instance, uh, the letter C. Now this is going to be a little broken for the moment, but let's see what happens first. Let me go ahead and save this. And I'm going to open a second tab so that we don't have to keep quitting and opening the program again. So let's go ahead and run hello.py. Uh, let's go ahead and type in Colton Ogden's name. And OK, so we're kind of one step closer to doing this. You can see that at least the iteration is working. Yeah, it seems to be working. And so that's a nice progress. And what's your middle name? Uh, Taylor, T-A-Y-L-O-R. So here, too, should still work if all we care about is your first name. Now, we're opening a can of worms if we want to get your middle name, too. We'll have to come back to that. But let's go ahead now and focus on cleaning this up a little bit. It's printing on one character per line. Do you want right. to propose for folks why that's happening? Um, because all we're doing is for every single C in name, which is going to be every character in the name, it's going to make it two checks. It, well, it's going to make one check. Um, two checks, potentially, possibly one check. But it's going to say, if the character is equal to space break, else print whatever the current character is. Mm -hmm. And print in Python, by default, uh, will print out a, a new line character unless you specify a separator. Exactly. And so this or an is, end of line character. Exactly. And this is a little ugly looking in Python, but you very verbosely have to say, the end of my string should not be the default, which is backslash n, but rather it's just, for instance, the empty string, thereby overriding it. Looks atrocious, but unfortunately, this is the way it is. And it's kind of, you know, it goes both ways. In C, by contrast, you you don't get the new line for free. You actually have to put backslash n almost everywhere unless you don't want it. So a Python optimized for presumably the common case. We have a few uh, comments on sure. Maybe we go through through some of those um, and get a, us up to speed here. Last time I remembered seeing was the hi from Denmark. So unfamiliar for says uh, bang up time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that. What's that? Do you know what that's a reference to? Uh, let me see. How do we how uh, do we spell that? Bang up time. Well, let's try it. So bang up time. I'm not sure if that's what you meant, yeah. but not sure what that is. But thank you. I'm hoping maybe that just means, hey, we're up, we're streaming. It's okay, time. we are up. Yes. Uh, uh, Minja27 to say that that was what uh, you he was referring to was your the black background. He thought that was the green screen. Oh no, that's our black screen. Uh, Hybrid Penguin, hello David and Colton. I'm a CS graduate from Lunds University in Sweden and loved your stream. It's really fun watching these streams on YouTube before work. But today I could finally join the stream. Oh, very nice. Glad to see you live. So as thank well. you very much, Hybrid Penguin. As Lee says, did you know that Python is named after Monty Python? I did, actually. And uh, yeah. that's a uh, homage to yesterday's stream with Veronica. That was one of the things that she brought up first. Yes, yes. I did. I saw a cop part of that yesterday, too. <laughs> and if you haven't, you can go on CS50's Twitch channel, look at the last uh, last few streams, in fact, as well as on YouTube.com slash CS50. Yeah, yesterday's kind of ties into today, because Veronica talked about a lot of uh, Python stuff. So super, super awesome stream. Below into the cartridge um, says, hi, David and Colton, watching you guys from Switzerland. Mm, hello from Cambridge. Keep these streams up. Very, very educational. Thanks for all the great content. Thank you, Blow into the cartridge. We have seen you before on stream. FTC227, hello from the UC University of Bristol. Thanks for making knowledge available around the world. Nice. We have a lot of a lot of coverage today. Indeed, all over the world. Welcome from Harvard University. Cloud XYZC says hi. Hello, Cloud. For Sunlight, who is Fatma on Facebook. Hello, Colin David, regulars, and everybody. Thank you, Fatma, for joining us. And Cloud Merchants Europe is well represented here. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, today. Lots of hellos, lots of hellos. And then uh, Babic Knight says name.split. Oh, spoiler, but yeah, good spoiler segue alert. too. 
Yeah, we can we can uh, we can take a look at that maybe next. I'm assuming that's probably where we're going. But. Yeah, indeed. So let me turn my attention back to the code where we just left off by adding Colton's fix, where we changed the end of line to quote unquote. Let me go ahead and rerun this now with just Colton Ogden, since his middle name doesn't really add much to the demonstration. And oh, so close. Now it just looks stupid. Now so. we need that that. Uh, New line character. Yeah, we're going to need it somewhere. So you know what? Let me just go ahead and put it at the very end of the program. We get one for free. We can just call print like this. And now we don't have to worry about being inside the loop anymore. All right. So let's go ahead and run this instead. Python of hello.py, Colton, voila. Now we've printed this all out. Works great. So we're on our way here, right? We've done a nice heuristic by just looking for the space. But honestly, this is pretty tedious. And it feels very C-like to iterate over the entire string looking for some special character. It's not wrong. It's perhaps not well designed because we could abstract this away. And as Bob McKnight proposes, we can actually use built in functionality. So let me go ahead and do that instead. Let me go ahead and say something like this components gets name.split and split on something like quote unquote with a space in the middle. So splits, if you're unfamiliar, let's go ahead and pull up the Python documentation here Python 3 uh, stir split. A uh, stir, of course, implying a string in Python, the data type. Let's we, go. We in. actually made a reference to how you're not a huge fan of the Python documentation yesterday. No, I already have misgivings about pulling this up. <laughs> and Ver Veronica was saying how, how much she is a fan of the of the Python documentation. No, I, we hereby retract all of yesterday's claims <laughs> to the contrary. Python's documentation is not very good, um, if only because it's very arcane, it's incomplete, uh, it leaves too much to the reader's imagination. So here we have stir dot split. Notice that it takes in two arguments both named arguments potentially, the separator as implied by SAP, which I specified as quote unquote with a space in the middle, and then max split, which tells you how many maximal substrings you want to get back in case you care. Negative one implies the default of no limit whatsoever. So let's just take a look here. These little screenshots in the documentation, if I zoom in here in green, are what are using Python's interactive interpreter. So some human in making the documentation typed this into their Mac or PC and pretty much just copied and pasted the output and put a green box around it. So for instance, if you had a string that had 1, 2, comma 3, and you call split on it, passing in comma as the split separator, well, you're going to get back this a data structure in Python of type list, which is like a dynamic array, which has 1 and 2 and 3, which are not numbers. They themselves are strings or substrings, specifically. Right. Here, too, notice we can max out the number of return values that we actually get in that list. Uh, here, we're getting 1. And then two comma three, all as one substring, because max split was specified as only split it once for us. And then here, we're getting back everything, including an empty string, because we now have two commas in a row. Okay. So just one tool in your toolkit. If you've never uh, used split before, it's just a useful way of literally splitting a string. And I think you can actually not specify the space, and it'll still default to spaces, right? Uh, let's well, let's take a look. When in doubt, consult the documentation, except when the documentation doesn't say. <laughs> uh, so using sep as the default delimiter string, that's it. Okay. So if sep is given, consecutive delimiters are not grouped together. Da 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 da. Splitting an empty string with specified separator. Oh, here it is right here. Yeah. Here we go. So if sep is not specified as you propose, or is none, which is the default per the signature up there, a different splitting algorithm is applied runs of consecutive white space as regarded as a single separator and the result will contain no empty strings as the start at the or the end if the string has leading or trailing white space consequently splitting an empty string or a string consisting of just white space with none returns the empty list it's kind of like a combination of strip and split it is so it normalizes the space for you so if you've got multiple spaces in between Colton and Ogden you're going to split on that so actually this is going to be a nice setup for what are regular expressions because we can split on exactly that. Right. Nice. All right. So let's go back to the code here and see what we get back. I called the return value components. And let's just go ahead and, for the moment, print out components to see what's going on inside there. Now I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go ahead and run Python 3 of hello.py. Let's go ahead and type in your full name this time so we get back as many components as possible. And you'll see, just like the documentation, we got back 1, 2, and 3, or Colton Taylor Ogden. Nice. So how do we go about getting just the first name if we're assuming a, a name like structured with first name? Last name, how do we get the first, would you say? Well, the lists in Python, you can index into them just like in arrays. Mm -hmm. So you could say index in by default in Python. Unlike Lua, Python is indexed at 0, mm -hmm. which is what most of the programming languages are indexed at. So you could just say, if you're getting the first element, just um, components index 0, components square bracket 0. OK, good. So we can do exactly that. So instead of printing components, let's print out components 0. 
go back to my code here, rerun hello.py, and run Colton Taylor Ogden, and voila, we're back where we started. Easy. All right, so easy peasy has nothing to do with regular expressions yet, and that's because we've deliberately confined ourselves to pretty simple inputs. Yeah. So let's make it a little more complicated, and instead of actually, uh, instead of actually getting, say, just an individual name out of it. Let's suppose that your input isn't your name, but your email address. Sure. Now it's getting a little more interesting, and we're not going to care so much who you are, but that you've given us a valid email address. So let's undo all this, and let's change our variable to be called email. Let's change our prompt to say email. And now let's just say something like uh, if email. Let's just do something like thanks for the email. Else, let's just go ahead and say, where is your email? So this is about as simple as validation can get. And you might recall doing this in like the context of web programming, just checking if a, a string is actually present or not. So let's now go to the program here, run hello.py, and type in, no, forget it. I'm not going to type anything. Huh, well, where is your email? So that's a nice little sanity check. All right, let me go ahead and type in my email address. Thanks for the email. Nice. But you know, let's just say oh, and just type in anything. Oh, thanks for the email. Unfortunately, now we have a validation problem. It'd be really nice to ensure that no, you gotta cooperate and give us a valid email address. So how do we do this with split or equals equals? Well, the first thing that we can do, most well, I would say all emails do need to have some sort of at symbol to okay. specify like the, the I don't know what the technical name for it is, but the name and then then the domain yeah. and sub and subdomain. Um, so we could just check to see whether there's an at symbol in the string as the very first step. Okay, like so that. let's do that. So let's check for an at symbol. And we did something like this before when we checked for a Colton. Right. Let's just check for an at symbol. So if at sign in email, let's go ahead and say thanks for the email. Else we can go ahead here and say print, f, uh, print out uh, where is your email again. All right, so you can probably see where this is going. It's not going to be a perfect program, but here we go. All right, Malin at harvard.edu, nice. Cogden at cs50.harvard.edu, nice. Uh, Colton is a, ah, uh. hmm, interesting. So here in the US, if you just put random punctuation in a sentence, it often means an expletive. Um, unfortunately. A lot of, a lot of uh, unflattering. Uh... Colton-related uh, topics today. Yeah, well, I'm just venting really today here on the internet. <laughs> yeah. But so it, of course, had an at sign in it, um, which was at the start of a sub, I mean, which just had an at sign somewhere. And unfortunately, that's the only question we're asking. So we have to be more precise. It can't just contain an at sign. So, so then we need to say, basically, make sure the at sign, first of all, it can't be at the start of the end, because mm -hmm. the at is the specifier for you have some name, some user, and then they belong to some domain, dot yeah. whatever. Um, so it can't be at the uh, at the beginning or the end. And thanks, Dragon Quest Slime, for following. Um, we should we have some chat to catch up on, but uh, we can maybe do that after the next example. Um, now, Bavik Knight proposes splitting on uh, the at sign here. We could do that. Unfortunately, that's going to still be vulnerable to a different sort of thread. If we have multiple at signs in the email address, even yeah. if though we don't want those, we're going to get multiple parts. And we could check for that, to be fair. But it's not going to be quite as clean. It'd right. be a lot nicer if I can say, this is the format that I expect. Does the user's input actually match this? The more so of these speak. sort of if statements, I think, that we can avoid is ultimately Absolutely. the goal. So let's start to do this a little more sophisticatedly, if you will. And instead of just checking sort of loosely for the presence of an at sign, let's see if someone's email input is username at domain. And we'll define it only at that super high level for now. So how might I go about doing this? Well, it turns out we can use the regular expression library. So a regular expression is a string that, as you said, as we began today, is a pattern of symbols, numbers, letters, punctuation. And included in many languages is support for matching regular expressions and checking whether the user's input matches indeed some pattern you intend. So RE stands for regular expression. You might verbally abbreviate regular expression as regex or, uh, or for regular expression. And so if I import this library, I'm going to have access to a whole bunch of Python functionality that comes related to regular expressions. Do you think there's a regex versus regex war like there is with gif and jif? 
Probably. Uh, regex. I say regex. What I mean, do you say? I say regex as well because you taught me regex. regex. Oh, well, you learned well. Uh, <laughs> regex. Regu I mean, that's fair because it's regular expression, and yet here I am saying regex. I just feel like it just flows like, it's more. Like, well, we say char as well, but it should probably be care. Yeah, that's horrible. Yeah. You, no one should ever say care for character. Oh, man. What <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, right. English is messy, as is, as our languages. Uh, uh, oh, wait a minute. M. Kloppenberg, a little spoiler here. Yes, there are even more sophisticated ways of doing this, uh, but we'll get there. We'll get there real soon. Uh, Andre had a, a funny thing he said earlier when we were talking about the Python documentation. Okay. Oh, man, where? how far up was it? Uh, oh, for sunlight, was it? Uh, no, Andre said, oh, where was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sunlight, which is FOTMA, said, does CSUD have any plan to improve the Python documentation? And then Andre says, with a flamethrower? <laughs> <laughs> that would not be uh, inappropriate. I say this mostly with some historical context. For many years, CS50 actually introduced students to PHP at the end of the semester instead of Python, the upside of which was PHP is even closer to C's syntax. It's pretty much C's syntax with dollar signs in front of variables and a few other changes. Um, but its documentation is outstanding, honestly, especially for newbies uh, to programming. It always has nice examples. It standardizes how it presents its arguments to functions, return values to functions. There's all and threaded discussion that's filtered out so that you have really good questions about the function or the library. So we gave that up when we switched to Python, which is really assumes, I think, a more comfortable demographic and also an, uh, an audience that is OK with incompleteness. So uh, unfortunately, we are now among them. I, I, I think the thread idea would be great for the Python documentation, because that's actually really smart. The thread, what do you the mean? Thread, having threaded discussion that gets filtered. Oh, yeah. Uh, I.e., re uh, like Reddit, for yeah. example. I think that's a great idea. Indeed. Do we so. miss any other questions? Let me make sure we didn't. Uh, we have people suggest, so Cloud XYZ DC has been suggesting a bunch of different things, checking for the at symbol. He's been uh, following along. And David's real feelings come out, says as I think in reference to the, the Colton curse joke. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and uh, let's not get yeah, let's not get started with the GIF pronunciation. And you oh, mean the the GIF the G GIF GIF. I say I say GIF. GIF. I think because I, I grew, grew up saying GIF, but then I decided to go to the source. And if you actually look at the author who created GIFs. He has asked that we call it GIF. Yeah, I feel like that's. I feel like that's. I think he's the only one with a say in this situation. Yeah, yeah, mo yeah. And then Nikolai uh, says uh, Python docs littered with inconsistencies. Mm, yes. No. So anyhow, so without getting too far off track, yeah. let's. Here we only got two lines of code here. We gotta <laughs> take this home. So we've just gotten the user's input, stored it in a variable called email, and let's now ask a more precise question: whether it looks like an email. And there are some more spoilers in the uh, chat window here, and we'll come back to those. Those are indeed uh, good next steps. But let's just start to ask this question. So how might we do this? Well, it turns out you could say something like this. If re dot, hmm, how do we do this? Well, I'm going to call it uh, search. And then I'm going to go ahead and specify a regular expression. Now, what's a regular expression? It's going to be something at something else, ultimately. And then I'm going to go ahead and say, print out thanks for the email. And if it doesn't match that, I'm going to go ahead and say the familiar before, uh, where is your email. And to be clear, so this string that you're putting in re.search, the function, oh, I apologize for that, the, the function that's in re. Dot, or the string that's the argument to re.search. Are we going to call it re and not re now? Re, uh, sorry, it's a little bit easier. I'm going to say re, but right, that's so fine. Re.search, so. re. uh, that string is basically is a sort of an abstract representation of what you're looking for. Exactly, right? okay. indeed. So it's something is not what we're actually looking for, but let's let's get there. Let's just take baby steps. Let me save this. Let me go ahead and rerun the program, and let me type in my email address is mailin.harvard.edu. Not going to validate because that is literally not something at something. And in fact, I screwed up entirely, missing one required positional argument string. Okay. So turns out I'm typing too quickly. I actually have to search a specific string. What is it that I actually want to search? Is needs to be the actual user's input. Right. So let me actually search search the email variable for something at something. Usman Lafri, thank you very much for joining us. Oh, and Elivas at the same time, thank you for joining us both. Welcome uh, aboard. So now let's go ahead and run this again. Let me go ahead and type in my actual email address. And of course, it doesn't validate because it is not something at something. Let's go ahead and do that, something at something. Enter. OK, so baby step. It's not with the end goal, but at least we're one step closer. We now need to generalize what the first something is and the second something. Yeah, because right now it's, it looks like it's just literally search, looking for something at something. Yeah, so it turns out, let's, let's, let's start small here and just search for harvard.edu specifically. OK. So now this still isn't quite correct, but now if I go back to my code and do something at something, that's not going to work anymore because it has to be harvard.edu. And indeed, something at harvard.edu 
could now actually work. Okay. Now it turns out that if we go ahead and do uh, mailin at harvard.edu, that too is not going to work. But if I go in here and stop expecting literally something and just look for at harvard.edu, let's go ahead and save this. Go back to my program and now go ahead and run mailin at harvard.edu. Now we're getting somewhere. Right. And I dare say if we go and search for, say, dmailin at harvard.edu, slightly different username, that seems to be working. But, but, but if we search for cogden at cs50.harvard.edu, what do you think? Uh, it's not going to work because there's the CS50 subdomain in front of it. Exactly. So where is your email? It's not recognizing you, even though clearly that's a good-looking email address. Can you can we bring up the source code one more time? I think I missed the exact step. Sure. Read search at Harvard. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Because it's looking basically just for that substring. Exactly. Right, true. Okay. Now we could get rid of the at sign and say, okay, well this will now detect Colton's email address too. But now he could be at not Harvard.edu, and that would still match. And so it's getting a little tricky to express precisely yet generously exactly what kind of uh, string we're looking for. Sure. So it turns out that re.search takes as its first argument not just a string, which is what I've been using, but a more general regular expression. And a regular expression is, again, a pattern. And it, in that pattern, you can use special placeholders for, ver uh, for strings or for substrings and characters. So in particular, if I want to say something, so to speak, conceptually, I can actually say put any character there and then expect the at sign. And if I want to expect two characters, I can do this, three characters, four characters, five characters, or so forth. Or if I'm not sure how many characters, I can say zero or more characters. Okay. Or that's a little weird for an email address because I do want a username there. So I can actually say one or more characters. So the star is could be zero, could be nothing. Zero or more. Plus means po any positive value number of characters. One or more, exactly. Um, and then the dot is just a wild card. A wild card that for the most part signifies any possible character, small white lie. We have implications with white space and other special characters. But for the most part, it means any letter, number, or punctuation symbol. OK, looks a lot more flexible now. All right, so it's still not going to handle you just yet, but it is going to handle me, it would seem. So let me go ahead and save this. Let me go back to my program, clear the screen, and start fresh. Let's go ahead and search for mailin at harvard.edu, still working. Nice. dmailin at harvard.edu, still working. at harvard.edu. Not working. Right, because you're specified it has to be at least one character. At least one character. Before. And is that technically true? Do emails have to have, can emails be one character long? as the first um, character of the, of the subject. I've seen like g.harvard.edu. One is fine. As a subdomain. I'm pretty sure you need at least one, though. Um, we, the email spec is actually super complicated. And someone proposed earlier that we use a library. That is going to be the best solution in the end, uh, because the format of an email address, even though most of us have pretty normal looking email addresses, there can be some funkiness in there. Um, but I'm pretty sure you need at least one character. So the plus is appropriate. But there's a way around this. Suppose that you forgot about the plus operator. You could say, well, give me one character and then give me zero or more of another. But plus exists just to express that same syntax, dot, dot, star, a little more succinctly. Gotcha. Makes sense. All right. So unfortunately, let me go back to the previous version using the actual plus. It'd be nice if we could actually support my email address and your email address. Right. So how do we go about expressing that? We kind of want to support something.harvard.edu, but also no such something. So the, maybe the zero or more thing we looked at earlier. Yeah. So we need a way to kind of express conditionally. Maybe it's there, maybe it's not. But if it is there, there's only one of those things. So let me go ahead and say, uh, well, maybe we'll support CS50 email addresses dot. But you know what? Let's kind of make this optional. And so I can use some special syntax. I can use a parenthesis around, whoops, I can use a parenthesis uh, to the left and to the right of what I want to make optional. Okay. And then how do I say uh, optional here? I don't want zero or more, because I don't want it to be CS50, 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 CS50.harbor.edu. So uh, I'm thinking like something or something else. Or could potentially work. So you could actually express or, and you could literally say a vertical bar, which means or this. And of course, there's nothing there, because my thought has ended with the parenthesis. Right. That looks a little weird, so I probably wouldn't typically do that. How else might we do this? Um, besides the or, I'm not, uh, I'm not sure, because the or is my first thought. Um... 
It's the right instinct, but there's just often multiple ways to express this. And so we've looked at star, which is zero or more, plus, which is one or more. There also is question mark, which is zero or one. Oh, OK, zero. OK, so it's limited between just zero or one. Zero okay, or one, so it's there or it's not. So it does, is 50 in this case. Exactly. OK, that makes sense. All right, so let me go ahead now and save this. We're saving hello.py. Let me go back here, clear the screen just so we can start fresh, and go ahead and type in mailin at harvard.edu. Thanks for the email. And here's the test of dmailin at harvard.edu. Looking good. At harvard.edu. Not looking good. That's expected. Right. And here we go. Cogden at cs50.harvard.edu. Thanks for the email. Nice. It so works. now we're detecting both of our strings here. Awesome. It's, uh, it's become a lot more robust. Yeah. Now, of course, CS50 is offered at Harvard and Yale. So some of our staff have cs50.yale.edu email addresses. How could we go about expressing this then? Uh, maybe for that, we could use the or, possibly. CS50 or Yale. If we okay. to, to limit the two, right? And we could maybe do it within the parenthesis where the CS50 dot is? Sure. So we could say CS50 dot Harvard or CS50 dot Yale. And, and then, then we can get rid of, oh, We'd or. have to get rid of this out here. Okay. But I think we can shrink this a little bit. There's a little redundancy here. We get rid of the CS50 or uh, take it outside of the yeah. Harvard or Yale. So let's unwind here. So this is where we started. Right. I, if I know that the Domain name now is going to be oops is going to be um, Harvard or Yale. I can literally express exactly that, right? Okay, and just say this. And Excellent. the vertical bar, much like a bitwise or in C or other languages, just means Harvard or Yale. And notice, you might be inclined to be nice and stylistically pretty and do something like this, like you might in actual programming languages. This is not good though here because you are now literally saying, give me a space, then Harvard, then a space, or Give me a space, then Yale, then another space. Right. So don't try to over-engineer your style. Just say exactly and only what you mean. It's very much white space sensitive. Indeed. Now, um, some folks might be inclined here to put a question mark here. Do I want to do that, though? Um, well, no, because you do want at least some domain, right? Exactly. We want some domain there, so Harvard or Yale. So we want one and only one, which is just implied by just typing it out. Right. All right, so let's try this. So let's go ahead and save this. Let's go over here. Let's go ahead and run on mailin at harvard.edu. Let's go ahead and run it on cogden.cs50.harvard.edu. Let's go ahead and run on mailin at cs50.yale.edu. Wow. We're looking pretty good. Looking it's very pretty fancy. versatile. Very, we're limited to the world of uh, Harvard and Yale, but still very At the flexible. moment, yes, indeed, at the moment. If you have a long list of schools, it's going to get messy quickly. But notice like this general principle. Like Honestly, if you were to look at this string, especially being new to regular expressions, I have no idea what this means. But notice how we built it up incrementally. And right. even to this day, you know, 20 some odd years after learning regular expressions, do I do this too? I start matching on the simplest thing possible, test it, add a little piece, Test it. Add another little piece, test it, so that you actually understand everything that's going on. Forget a little syntax, Google it. Forget a little syntax, <laughs> yes. Google it. Sure, indeed. Um, because I, it looks very cryptic otherwise at yeah. first glance. I'm thinking maybe we can uh, we can take a few sure. questions. Sure, let's take a look. A few comments. So maybe just scroll up here and see where we stopped at. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. So, oh, uh, Nikolai was referring to the PHP code with do in inconsistent documentation. I'm actually, I, it's been up forever since I looked at the PHP mm. documentation. Jaffix interchange format says M. Kloppenberg in reference to, to GIF. Oh, yep, Traffics. okay, indeed. Uh, oh, Nikolai with uh, some inappropriate, so from yesterday as well. So if we could keep it PG, keep it kid friendly, uh, that would be much appreciated. I do not want to ban anybody from the chat, um, but we cannot have uh, any of that sort of thing con continuing to go on. Uh, appreciate the enthusiasm, though. Nick Napoli, uh, is that the running zombie from the game Dead Ahead? I'm actually not sure. It's a very ubiquitously seen Twitch uh, um, widget, I think. I I'll have to Google that, actually. I'm not sure. I'm referring to the, the follow zombie, I think. Mm. Um, blah, blah, blah. A lot of comments about uh, the profanity. Twitch Hello World says, you mean plus, not star, right? I think he's referring to... Um, well, we covered both of them, so I think I think I think you. As soon as he wrote that, you probably covered the both of them, the star and the plus. Indeed, yep, yep. Um, okay, just making hey, sure. Twitch hello world. Uh, Twitch hello world. Uh, so here, plus uh, prof type plus. Though I thought Colton said star. Uh, I'm not sure. Did I say the wrong one? I don't recall, to be honest. But let's scroll down further. I think uh, Twitch hello world asked us. Oh right, they said it was just explaining afterwards. I think I'll mix it. Yeah. Said, okay, oh, down okay. here. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Uh, are plus star and question defined in the function read.search or in the general 
Python documentation things? Uh, technically, the general documentation, because there are other functions that support regular expressions in Python. There's another function called match instead of search, which is almost the same, except it starts searching at the beginning of a string. Frankly, it's not all that much more compelling, though there might be an optimization gain there. Uh, but the syntax is actually derived from earlier languages. Python has simply incorporated them into its own syntax. So the argument to uh, re search and the argument to re match and other functions to potentially uh, use that standard regular expression syntax. And I believe you can type an R in front of the string, and in most text editors, it'll, it'll syntax highlight the regular expression, right? Uh, not oh, my not, not version of Vim, Vim here. Oh, okay. Yeah, That's and that actually stands for a raw string, which just is, tends to be used for regular expressions to gotcha. escape okay. certain characters. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, is M. M. Kloppenberg tossed the, uh, uh, the RE, I'll say RE, not RE, the RE documentation link in chat. Um, how does it differentiate between a wildcard and a literal dot? Ooh, really good question. At the moment, it doesn't. And in fact, I've been a little sloppy here because it turns out, let's see if I can do this. Uh, let's go ahead and run this program with Malin at uh, Harvard X edu. Ooh. Because the dot is just saying any character you want here, whether it's a period or whether it's something else. Indeed. So even though I've specified a dot and it looks perfectly sensible, harvard.edu, yale.edu, dot indeed means any character. So you have to escape it. And this is true in a lot of languages, Python among them. Anytime you want to say, no, I mean a literal dot, Often, the answer is just to escape it, the, the convention for which is a single backslash. So right. this now means not a special placeholder, any character, literally a dot. Much like you would see for most, um, what, what's it called, escape characters in C. Yep, exactly. Backslash N, backslash T, backslash A, any number of other ones as well. So let's go ahead and rerun this now. Malin at Harvard X edu. That does not work now, but if I go ahead and type in mailin.harvard.edu, now in fact it works. Nice. So I should, for good measure, go back in and even fix this here, because I do want literally CS50 dot if it's present, but I don't want to put it here, right. because then your username would have to be dot, literally. Yeah. Or more, more than one dot, right? Because you have the plus. One there. or more dot, yeah. indeed. Exactly. Um, make sure we didn't miss anyone. Amen uh, says hello. I'm Amen. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I've finished this video, but can't verify my account to get a certificate because I don't uh, can't have an ID. What should I do? Uh, as always, Minter27 emails certificates at cs50.harvard.edu, which wonderfully is a valid email address per today. <laughs> nice. Unfamiliar. The art of regular expressions: capturing what you want and only what you want. That's very beautiful. Unfamiliar. Thank you. Uh, Internet down. Lunch break says President of Mars. Uh, sorry to hear about that. Fatma says thank you, Colton. For, uh, there are a lot of content inappropriate. We don't need that here. Uh, as a Colton is nice, even when he's scolding people. Uh, fought my history professional, blah, blah, blah. Okay, a lot of thank you very much, everybody, for the for the kind uh, words. So. Um where to go from here? All right, so it turns out it's still buggy, and no one seems to have pointed this out yet. Let me go ahead and claim that, you know what, my name, my email address is mailin at harvard.education, which frankly these days might actually be a valid TLD, but no, let's that's pretend true. it isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Educational, that's not, TLD, I bet. TLD, top level domain, meaning the things you put at the end of a, in a website or an email address. Exactly. So let's go ahead and type this in, and dang it, that is not harvard.edu. So where's the bug? Well, you're just searching for it in the string, right? Mm. And, and you, like you said, match will uh, identify. Does match? Uh, OK, so you said match starts at the beginning of the string. Mm -hmm, does that mm -hmm. mean that it will keep searching on after that? And it'll, so it, wouldn't, it basically search with just the starting at the beginning? Correct. And Only not, at the and beginning. And not just matching the contents of the string itself? Correct. OK. So in that case, search and match would have the same bug. Mm -hmm. You're just doing a search, just iterating through it. And as soon as it finds the edu part, it doesn't care whether there's nothing after it exactly. or whether there's another cation or something after it. Indeed. So we need to kind of specify that we want to search to the end of the string, and the very last character has to be edu, right. end of thought. And so it's kind of non obvious how to express this, right? Because you want to say no more characters, but right. how do you type no more characters? Well, the authors of regular expressions years ago had to just decide on an arbitrary symbol that denoted end of string. And so the character they chose is, weirdly enough, the dollar sign. Interesting. So that's not a literal dollar sign. That means edu have to be the last three characters of the string. Otherwise, we're not going to get a match. If you wanted a literal dollar sign, would it be backslash dollar sign? Indeed. If you want edu money, <laughs> then yes, put the dollar. Uh, back, uh, escape the dollar sign. But here we want a literal dollar sign. Okay. So now let's go back here, run it again, mailin at harvard.educational. Now it's no longer a valid email address, but mailin at harvard.edu 
is actually a valid email address. Okay. All right, so it's not that material that we're matching at the beginning of the string here, but maybe. Let me go ahead and try this again. Uh, so uh, David J. Malin at harvard.edu. That's not actually my email address, but it seems to match the pattern. Yeah, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't fly for a normal email because you have spaces. Yeah, that's not going to work, but mm, I still think there's a bug. So honestly, after all these minutes of like building up this regular expression, we're still not done, but we're almost there. But this would be a million times worse if this were a series of if statements. Oh, yes. At least. Yeah, checking for all possible valid email addresses is not going to be very fun either. So what do we want to express here, perhaps? Um, no white spaces allowed, essentially. Yeah, so how would we express that? So it turns out we can approach this in a few different ways. Uh, your first instinct might be to say, well, email addresses should only have, let's say, alphabetical letters. Sure. So how might we express that? Well, it turns out you can have what are called character classes in a regular expression, whereby you literally type square brackets, and then you type out all of the characters you want to allow. So for instance, A, B, C, D, E, F, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. I mean, this is not going to scale very well because I haven't even typed in the lowercase letters. So thankfully, character classes also support ASCII or Unicode ranges. A through Z okay. is valid. And it means the exact same thing as typing out all 26 letters. And if we want to say lowercase, we can say little a through little z. That will also work. And it does not matter that the big Z is next to the little a. Each of these is being treated as a single character, except for the hyphen, which means a range of characters. And it's specifically within the context of these square brackets. Because if In you the did this outside yes. of the square brackets, that would be looking for the literal string a dash z. Literally, literally. Okay. The square brackets are so important here. And if I want to do numbers, that will work too, at least for decimal, I can say 0 through 9. Okay. So now I've got a lot of possible usernames now. I'm skipping some characters, but we'll come back to that in a moment. Now that would seem to be a better way of expressing this and omitting spaces. Right. So let's go ahead here, go back and try this again. David J. Malin at harvard.edu. And interesting, it's still actually matching. Tuan Vu9884, thank you very much for the follow. Um, because it's doing a search and it's finding, it's still finding mail in at harvard.edu. Yeah, you're good, you're good. So I, I, I was taught, I was taught by the way. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. wink, wink. Yeah. So, so we kind of want to express that there cannot be anything to the left of these characters. So just to be super clear, Colton has indeed identified the fact that this character class, which is saying give me one or more of these preceding characters, a through z, a through z, or zero through nine, that matches because m-a-l-a-n matches exactly that. There's no spaces in Malin. But there is a space before it, and then there's the period, and the J, and the space, and the David before it. But the catch is that all of that stuff can happen kind of before this character class here. So right in this space, theoretically, is there room for David, J, or any other number of strings that have spaces, because this character class is only going to match what it can, which is Malin. So in this case, would we want to switch to the re.match and start from the beginning? We could. So let's try that. So if we go to re.match, uh, re being uh, the library, uh, re. Match. I actually don't know what most people say. <laughs> re.match will start by definition from the start of the string. So let's go ahead and save this. Let's go back here, try one more time, David J. Malin with those two spaces, and now it seems to be catching the nice. mistake. Now let's go ahead and do Malin at harvard.edu. That's working as intended too. But we don't have to do this. And honestly, I find this annoying in Python that you have to vaguely remember whether it's match or search. And honestly, I get them backwards all the time. Literally before we started, I Googled to make sure I got it right. I just tend to use search. You might pay theoretically, I suppose, if we read closely in the docs, a slight performance penalty. Because by saying re match, you're giving the um, uh, the runtime uh, in advantage by just starting literally at the start of the string. But frankly, that tends to be an over-optimization. So I, I would actually just use the opposite of the dollar sign, ah, okay. which completely confusingly is the caret symbol, uh, which is over one of the numbers on your keyboards typically, depending on the country you're from. And that would mean start from the start of the string. Dollar sign means end of the string. And now we have a complete thought from yeah. start to end. I like that. I like that better. I think it's just kind of cleaner. And even though you could certainly make an argument for using re match instead. All right, so let's try this. Save this. Go back to our program, type in our David space J space Malin at harvard.edu. Nope, not allowed. Right. Malin at harvard.edu. 
is indeed now allowed. And just for good measure, make sure we didn't have a regression, Colton Ogden. Regression at, testing. At csft.harvard.edu is also now working. Nice. So we're in pretty good shape now. Um, why don't we pluck off a few questions that yeah. I saw coming in related to emails. Yeah, let me go up to where we stopped. So Bavik says, oh yeah, raw string, to your, which is what you said. Mm -hmm. um, very easy tutorial in regex is cloud X, Y, Z, C. So that's what uh, he's saying that you're doing an awesome job. Oh, thank you very much. Um, some of us are new to it, like me, says Astley. Yeah, no, this is great. This is awesome. Uh, Akshay Montan says, hello. Uh, good to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so, uh, Brenda's plucking off as well certificates at csu.harvard.edu for cert questions. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, Midget27 says, thank you. Prab01, I need a course on statistics. We are. <laughs> I think we're going to have a, uh, a, uh, a, a, sorry, I'm blanking, a stream on R with uh, Andy Chan in a couple weeks, so which will kind of go into biostatistics. So tune in for that one. Um, Vim, uh, dollar sign, Vim's shortcut to go to the last character of the line, is that the Oh, case? yeah. If this is now unrelated to regular expressions, notice my cursor is currently here on the screen. If I hit the dollar sign, I can coincidentally go all the way to the end of the line as well. It almost seems like it is related. It seems like that's probably deliberate. Oh, I suppose it is, actually. Yeah. Yes, dollar sign is indeed deliberate, and I can hit the caret symbol to go to the yeah, beginning of the string. To, yeah, they have to design it that way. That's cool. Vim, Vim tutorial, Vim tutorial would be cool. There you go. Well, you're going to have to get someone better at Vim than me, though. <laughs> it, it would edu dollar except mail in at harvard.educational.edu, or would it only match edu only at the end? If you literally type .edu dollar sign, it would only match .edu at the end. Right. If you wanted to support educational, we can go down this road. Notice that we could do edu educational, put that in parentheses, add a question mark, and make it optional. Nice. So that it's there or not there. OK. And I think she was saying um, also educational edu, like have edu come out by itself after another string, like educational edu. Uh, no. So if you have dot edu um, dollar sign, you will literally match only those four characters, right. dot edu dollar sign. Anything more expressive than that, you're going to need to lengthen the string. Right. Um, we can have .gmail, Yahoo, et cetera. How to check that after the, uh, the at symbol, we have to have one uh, dot character. Say that once again. Um, we can have uh, Gmail or Yahoo, et cetera. How do we check after the at symbol to have only one period character? Oh, so right now, we would have to jettison our, our subdomain here. So right now, we are allowing for cs50.harvard.edu uh, sorry, we're allowing for CS50 dot to either be there or not be there. That's, of course, where s potentially our second dot is coming from. So we could certainly get rid of that second dot by just no longer supporting subdomains within harvard.edu. And what's nice about this now is that we could support even other universities. So for instance, we could add in Stanford in there or MIT or any number of others without worrying about the subdomain, so long as they all end in .edu. Or, let me just free up some space, I could even be a little crazier, and it's going to look a little ugly, but I could do this in parentheses, and then I could say something like or gmail.com gmail and actually support either harvard.edu or yale.edu or gmail.com so long as you build these up in nested fashion. So this is kind of like arithmetic with parentheses. Growing up, if you did lots of additions and subtractions and multiplications, divisions inside parentheses, order of operations matters most. So when reading these things, you're going to want to look for the most deeply nested parentheses, for instance, harvard.edu, then work your way out from those, thereby looking at this. Then you can notice, oh, here's a vertical bar. So that means this thing to the left or this thing to the right is what's going to have to match. Nice. And uh, Bolko87, thank you so much for following us. Um, let me make sure that we didn't miss any other questions. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Is it, wait, is this the professor from CS50 at Harvard? Says home line. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yes, this is David Malin, the Jedi Master, the Master Yoda. Named by someone else, not David. <laughs> um, and yep, and they're saying that a carrot is the Vim shortcut to get to the yellow line. So it's turning into a Vim chat. It, a little bit. Yeah, that's kind of the that's kind of the direction a lot of these streams go. Shane Hughes, 1972. Is it advantageous to wait uh, for the next calendar year to start the course? No, I think um, I, if you have time now, start now. There's always going to be something new on the horizon. Uh, you know, companies release new hardware every year, so I think the same logic you might apply to buying a laptop or a computer or a game console or whatnot applies here. Yes, you could wait for the next one, but you're then missing out on the next few weeks, months, or whatever that duration is. So if you want to start something, whether it's CS50 or something hardware or some other course, start when you have the time. That being said, we are currently in the process of getting our January 1 release for CS50 on edX 2019, which uses the 2018 material 
uh, up and online if folks want to put that in their calendar. But uh, the folks can go on YouTube just to see uh, CSVD 2018's lectures right now if you want to get a head start on all the material and then sort of do the work and then submit your content, submit your work um, for the 2018 content at the start of the calendar year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Fun. Certainly welcome to wait. Brenda, yes, we can see you. Uh, so for all the extensions, we have to hard code the subdomain. Short answer, yes. You could generalize this with a function. You could build up your string using even uh, rows from a database. But short answer, yes. In the simplest form, you just or them all together using the vertical bar. Of course, at some point, it becomes less readable. So frankly, from a design perspective of my code, if I want to handle both cs50.harvard.edu and yale.edu, I might leave this regular expression now alone. And if I want to actually support another domain, I might do something like this and say, you know what, I'm also going to support gmail.com or, you know what, let's go ahead and support gmail.com or Outlook dot com to support two dot coms. And you could start to bucketize your conditions into these are the edus, these are the dot coms. It's adding some redundancy and it's indeed being a little more wasteful because you might be checking the strings more times than you need to, but you're probably over optimizing if you care about that. It lets you're running this code in a loop that's just executing so many times that those milliseconds add up. Frankly, I would find something like this probably more maintainable, more readable, even if you're paying a, a minor performance price. This would be definitely if you have some sort of semantic value associated with different Different domains, but a lot of websites yeah. probably just have generic. You can have any valid email from any given website or domain, indeed, and it will probably, I'm guessing, just use the same pattern that we showed at the very beginning, where of the A to Z. A Essentially, to Z. you can actually be more fancy than that. And in fact, let me undo this so that we can build this out. Many of you online probably have email addresses that have, for instance, uh, dots in them, dashes in them, underscores in them. Turns out, character classes are wonderfully receptive to that. You can literally just put uh, an underscore. You can put a escaped dot and you can put an escaped dash. The escaped dash is super important now because in the context of those square brackets it represents a range right. character as well. So now that's even more expressive than it was before. Volem, thank you for joining us. I can listen to Mr. Malin for hours. Great teacher. <laughs> Um, Thank you. If you want to do so, again, all of our lecture videos are on uh, CS50's YouTube channel, which you're probably, you might be watching it right now if you're watching this uh, Twitch video on YouTube. Uh, oh, I like what Bavik Knight has proposed here. Uh, your regular expression is a little fancier. You're supporting not only .edu and .com right. and .org, but uh, this backslash W is kind of interesting. Yeah, at the start of the string, which will allow us, to, I'm, I'm assuming it would allow us to put some spaces beforehand, before yeah. the email, so that way if the user accidentally hits space or whatnot in the field, it will. It won't uh, uh, say that there's an error. Good hypothesis, but not quite. Well, I, if I, I can wrong? clarify, if but I'm wrong, I that's okay. I'm actually going to pull up the documentation here because I think it might help to see a more thorough listing of the various symbols that are allowed. So oh, let me go I ahead and search Python. It's any non-white space character. Is that correct? There you go. It's okay. literally the opposite of uh, what you were I saying. I forgot about the slash. By the way, Mr. Tulio Noguera, thank you very much for the follow. And B. Jeffers, I'm not sure if I caught that one. Thank you very much for the follow as well. So here I am on Python's regular expression operation. So you can see this on docs.python.org slash three slash library slash re.html. So here you'll see Python's documentation for regular expressions. And it's way more verbose than we need to get into just now. But let me start to scroll down to regular expression syntax. You'll see some nice uh, introductory explanations of what these things are. Though learning from the Python docs is probably going to be uh, easier said than done. <laughs> but here's a list of the special characters. So dot, we already discussed, meaning any character except for a new Line. So I did say there's some corner cases with white space, and that's indeed one of them. Carrot, which matches the start of the string. Dollar sign, which matches the end of the string. Star and plus and question mark. Man, we actually bit off a lot of these for now. Right, yeah. Let's keep scrolling further. I'm going to wave my hands at some of these because there's some fanciness you can get into that, honestly, in my life, I've not had terribly many occasions to need uh, greedy matches or oh, sometimes greedy matches. But you can also do look ahead and some other fancier features. And I don't think we'll get too into depth on that. But rest assured that if you ever encounter a problem that you're struggling with with regular expressions, odds are you can solve it. So dive back into the documentation to find some additional feature that they might have. We didn't look at some of these. Uh, curly braces actually have special significance. So let's actually come back to um, the code we were writing earlier. And suppose like someone was proposing we support edu, uh, com, and org, like Bob Knight was proposing. Suppose we just kind of generalize that. I well, could say com or edu or uh, org. Or you know what, those are three letters. We could maybe a little lazily just say, you know what, go ahead and just support three letters, dot, dot, dot. 
very lazy. It's going to allow for weird sub, uh, domains that don't actually exist, but so be it. But you could also express that by doing this. So now things are getting really cryptic, but if we parse this, you see Harvard or Yale. Then you have a literal dot because it's escaped. Then you have a wild card, any character, and then three copies of any character. This doesn't have to be the same character. It's just any character, any character, any character. And is this three uh, referring to the dot that you put before that those brackets, or is it, or is it by default? Uh, brackets just no, it's character. literally referring to the dot beforehand. So okay. if you wanted to refer to the same letter again and again and again, uh, then it has to be here. So if you wanted to have the letter A, it would be A, A, A now, Got or it. dot would be something, 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 but different somethings. Makes sense. And if for whatever reason you want to support, say, two characters or three, which you might with domain names like country codes or two letters or uh, more traditional domain TLDs are three, you could do two comma three and do a range. Okay. So cool. syntax is getting really crazy now, but again, if you just focus on like what the basic definition is, it all works out pretty cleanly. Uh, Code Beastie and Stimpy, thank you very much for the follows. Oh, nice to see you as well. And let's let's finish this thought with backslash w. So let me go back to the documentation. And now I'm just curious. Let's just start going and going and going. And let's see. Here we go. So in the discussion of character classes, as denoted by square brackets, right. uh, you see a whole bunch of bullets here explaining things. I'm going to fast forward to this one. Character classes such as slash w or slash s, capital S, are also accepted inside a set. So let's find the documentation. It says define below. So let's keep going, excuse me, let's keep going, going. There's a lot of features of regular expressions, but you'll use these uh, less frequently, some of them. OK, here we go. Now we're getting to the special characters. Uh, and here, let's fast forward, slash w. So for Unicode or stir patterns, it matches Unicode word characters. Uh, okay. This includes most characters that can be part of a word in any language, as well as numbers and the underscore. And you can see, if you actually use ASCII, which is a subset of Unicode, just fewer characters that have been around for uh, since the beginning of computers, um, notice that it's using almost the same pattern that we were using, except that I added in dots and dashes to support things like Gmail. When I saw it for the first time, I thought it was W for white space, which is no, why I totally reasonable. that uh, instinct. But we got something for you, too. Uh -oh. Backslash S, lowercase s, does indeed match any space, which includes a literal space here, uh, tab character, new line, carriage return, form feed, and vertical feed no, as well. I don't know what a form feed is. It's, form, uh, feed? form feed is sort of old school, where it moves down to the next line, I think, from uh, typewriter days, essentially. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. I think that's what it is. Uh, it's been some time since I needed to worry. But notice, let me point out one other thing. If we keep scrolling, you'll see kind of the opposite, backslash capital S, which matches the opposite of backslash S. So if you want not white space, but anything other than white space with some of these character symbols, you can actually just capitalize it. Same thing for backslash W. If you don't want a word character, you want everything else, all the funky characters on the keyboard, then you can do backslash capital W. Okay. All within those character classes or even outside if you just want to match one such thing. So a lot of learning regular expressions kind of diving into this documentation, memorizing what all these sort of symbols mean, but the logic for it is actually very simple. Yeah. And in fact, unfortunately, regular expressions uh, syntax is kind of hard to Google because you're typing in crazy sequences of symbols. So just express it in English or, or any language you speak to see if you can find your way to Stack Overflow or someone's explanation. Like regular expressions avoid white space. Yeah, exactly. Like that. That's a good one. Should we uh, take a look at the chat again? Yeah. Twitch Hello World do some people who have or rent their own server also create email addresses using these? Is there a point at which one might simply code some wild cards, like Colton is saying, then have a program that simply tests that email, uh, tests that the email um, goes through without receiving an error message? That's a really good question. And I would make the distinction between syntactically valid and actually valid, where actually valid in my mind would mean it's a real email address that belongs to a real human that's ideally checking that email account. We're just talking about syntax today. Regular expressions cannot tell you if cognin at cs50.harvard.com edu actually exists or if mailin at harvard.edu actually exists, all I can tell you is that yes or no, this email address is structured in a way consistent with the email, the formal definition of an email address. Makes sense. Okay. So yes, you would need to use like a cloud-based service or your own server to actually send a verification email to the human, like all of us are in the habit of receiving when we sign up for new accounts on websites, to actually see if the human responds and confirms the existence. Got it. Bavic Knight says, do we need to escape in a group? I think it doesn't need to escape in a group. Uh, in a group, in a capture group, yes, you would still need to escape, if that's what you mean. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. How difficult would it be to create a regex parser from scratch? That's a good question. Uh, how to, uh, to create a regular expression? Um, 
parser from scratch. It depends on how many features you want to support. To be honest, most of the features that we have just discussed can be implemented relatively simply. And in fact, if we can get all academic on you, can I pull the whiteboard out yeah, for yeah, a moment? Absolutely. So I'll if you've never, as well. sure. So here we have an actual whiteboard, no technology here. I've pulled it onto the screen, and I've got my black marker here. So it turns out that regular expressions uh, map to, academically, something called a class of regular languages that can be expressed in uh, special syntax. Uh, that is regular expression syntax. But it turns out they map directly to what are called DFAs, or deterministic finite automata, which are very simple machines that you can implement on Mac or PC or even on a whiteboard that represent that that particular language. So for instance, uh, the way you would typically draw a DFA, or deterministic finite automaton, is with states. So I might draw a circle here, and hopefully everyone can see this from afar. That circle, I'm just going to put a little caret symbol there to imply that this is the first state. And if I want to ultimately draw a picture that represents a email address, I'm going to essentially do something like this. I'm going to think of the email address as having three parts, the beginning, the middle, and the end. And the end will be my final state here, just denoted with a slightly different symbol. And what I want each of these states to represent is something. So I might here think of this state as representing the at sign. At that point, I've read in an at sign. So before that is the username. And after that is the end of my expression. Now, how am I actually going to do this? So here, I might draw a picture that says something like this. In order to start from this state, and move from this state, I have to consume some number of letters. And let's keep it simple, and let's just say that it's alphabetical letters for now. So I have to consume either an A through a Z for simplicity in all lowercase. This, though, transition means that you would only consume one letter at a time. So at the moment, this picture represents an email address that only has a single letter in it. And in fact, I'm going to have to draw another dot here to follow this pattern so that I have two states here. This is before the at sign. This is after the at sign. So if I draw another transition or edge here, that represents the at sign. And then the end of my email address, let's say, has another alphabetical letter, which is A through Z. So short, uh, short of it is now I have built a machine, or the rather a picture of a machine, that says you can have any character that's alphabetical. Then you have an at sign. Then you have a, another letter as your domain. This is obviously incomplete because A at A is not an email address, at least as we've defined it thus far. So we would need to start to enhance this picture a bit more. So what would that actually mean? Well, if I want to support one or more A to Zs, I need to enhance this picture. I need to add another state to my machine. And so I'm going to move the start of the machine over here, which you can still now see over here. I'm going to go ahead and have an edge going to this state, which is A through Z. But then I'm going to have another uh, transition that allows me to, for instance, go uh, back and forth on A to Z as well. And notice this is a deliberate loop. I can consume an A or Z for my string, and then if it's two letters, I can do it again. If there's two le three letters, I can do it again. Four letters, I can do it again. And when I'm ready to read the at sign, I can then, whoops, oh, oops, 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 David messed up. Uh, sorry. This is why we don't do things on the fly. <laughs> uh, here we have, uh, sorry, we have the at sign there. So here we have, here we go. I drew it in the wrong place, my apologies. I can consume A to Z here. And now let me go ahead and draw the original dot here, A through Z here. My apologies. So I consume the first letter. Then I can immediately consume the at sign from the user's input, and then another letter, thereby putting me from username, at sign, to domain. Or I can consume one letter for the username, consume another, another, another. And now I have a username that is one or more characters. And so you see this beautiful mapping here. This now represents, essentially, the block that we described as dot plus earlier, if again we're keeping it simple with just letters of the alphabet. So you have this direct mapping now between the syntax we've been talking about and the machine, at least pictorially, that you might build. And so implementing a parser for a regular expression really amounts to implementing code 
that does this. And you'll see some familiar constructs. Obviously, if you're doing something again and again, this connotes a loop. And all of you know how to implement a loop probably using a for loop, a while loop, or maybe even recursion to do something again and again. So you can imagine writing code that just has different states or constants that represent each of these states, where one of your variables might mean I am reading the email, uh, the username. Then another state that means I have read the at sign. Then a final state that means I have read the domain name. And as soon as you end up with a value in that variable that represents the so-called end state, you have parsed an email address. So that's like a whole course in, um, in a whole, uh, let's say, week in CS theory. But yes, implementing a parser with a regular expression really boils down to just thinking about how you model that regular expression using a certain syntax, map it to a picture of a machine, and then implement that machine in software. Let us know if you want David to teach a, a theory course, because uh, I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, that was a cool. Hope that wasn't too much of a tangent there, but that stuff is really quite fun and it really does bridge the theory and the practical world. No, no, that was great. Some people had some comments. They said, um, can you join the first and the second circles instead of two, just make one? I think maybe make the first one a loop, or does that first one need to be a separate node? Really good question, and that's why I was struggling on, under pressure. Um, the first state needs to lead to another state because you have to consume at least one symbol. And if right. we had put the loop on that first state, we could accidentally never go around that loop, immediately start with the at sign, and that's going to give us an invalid email because address. Because it's looking for those sort of, uh, what are they called, transitions. And exactly. The, the, the transition, it can take those like, as paths. Paths, exactly. And execute on them. Exactly. Um, we can continue the same mapping after the at state uh, also to get more than one A to Z. Yes. And I think that's just because for, for brevity you drew it. But you could have another loop at the end after the at. Yes, I didn't finish the story. Right. We need an actual uh, loop or cycle to do multiple letters. And frankly, we'll want additional states if we want to have a dot and then a TLD like right. edu or .org or whatever. Yeah, that's super cool. It reminds me of a, like a finite, is this a finite state machine is the mm -hmm. same thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we use that in, like the, in the games course. Games, yeah, yeah. absolutely, all yeah. the time. And honestly, if you're familiar, they're getting a little dated these days, but uh, uh, soda machines. If you've walked up to a soda machine and put in coins, no matter the country you're in, a soda machine is a finite state machine or a deterministic finite automaton. Deterministic in the sense that no matter how many times you put put in the right amount of money, it will behave exactly the same way, assuming there's still soda left. And the way you can think about a soda machine is being similar, just as with regular expressions, each of those states represented where you are in the string. I have read a character. I have read multiple characters. I have read an at sign. I have read the domain name. Each of those circles on the, on the board represented something conceptually. A soda machine in the US, for instance, is going to have different states as well. You can insert a dime, uh, a nickel, and a quarter, but not pennies, for instance, typically. So there is probably a five cent state, there's a 10 cent state, there's a 15 cent state, there's a 25 cent state, a 30 cent state, but there's not a 31 or 32 or 33 cent state because every time you drop a coin in the machine, it's as though the soda machine is following a transition, following a transition. And as soon as you get to the dollar state or however expensive the soda is, then the soda pops out. Can you describe computer programs, therefore, as being a deterministic finite automata? Uh, some programs, yes, if they are indeed behaving completely deterministically. If they're oh, behaving non-deterministically, you might have some randomness. But even randomness in computers is uh, deterministic at the end of the day. So short answer, yes. OK, that makes sense. That makes sense. Let's make sure we uh, can keep up with the chat here. By the way, thank you to Axelis for following us. Um, I saw that pop up during the uh, the whiteboard session. I oh, I think we just signed ourselves up for a, a course on finite state machines. I thought the uh, I thought that it was actually really cool. I like the whiteboard. It's a shame. We, next time we'll try to get the draw fifty in uh, integration to be. Set Indeed, up. if you saw one of our previous streams with Colton and Dan Coffey, we have a beautiful screen and web-based software that Dan wrote via which we can draw pictures as well. Yeah. Much better than old school. And David has an amazing new. Uh, what is this thing called? Uh, well, we'll see here. Just off screen is a beautiful new uh, tablet that we can draw on, which okay. will allow us to draw pictures and diagrams much more easily. Yeah, we'll try to get that set up for our next stream together. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let me see where we are. Uh, can you do this? Uh, yes, a theory course, Hart says all programmers. Is there a term for this type of diagram? Yes, a theory course by him would be fun since he's always so practical regarding applications too and scaffolds nicely. And I think you did say um, finite state machine or deterministic finite automata would mm -hmm. be the name for that. Right? Yep. Um, yeah, you, we need that course, says Osman. Anything taught with passion will be interesting, so keep the lessons coming, says President Morris. Says David. David is uh, very good at that. Well, that's an old school way of doing it, says Bevick Knight. 
Yeah. Thank you. Old school, and when we bring the the tablet, we'll bring the old school with the new school. True. Though DFA's have been around for a long time too, so maybe yeah. that's the old school way of doing it. It was like probably when did it first come out? You think like the fifties or forties when? Yeah, around there. It derives from math and discrete math. Turing, yeah. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. In terms of design, since you have to program the verification code too to check the email address as a real email, is there any reason not to be somewhat loose and broad in this regex code, such as using wildcards and hard coding each of the .com, .tv, etc.? Short answer, yes. Uh, your odds are these days you're not going to hard code all the TLDs because there's an atrocious number of them. Hundreds probably, maybe approaching a thousand or something crazy. Um, so yes, you're probably going to focus more on syntax and not on the validity of those top level domains because as someone alluded to earlier, you're probably, and actually I think it might have been Twitch Hello World, you yourself, you're probably going to send the user a confirmation email and if the email bounces because the domain doesn't exist, you've got your answer and you don't have to infinitely exhaustively check whether or not the email address itself was a valid domain and if you get the user to click a link confirming the existence then you're okay so yes uh, so you probably want to do a high pass at the email address using a regular expression like we are or better yet and we'll end on this note too using a library that comes with Python or any number of other languages just to uh, do that initial validation because humans at least here on campus among Harvard University students we can tell you that about 10% of them mistype their email address if we just ask them on a Google form to type it in unless we pre-populate it which we do instead Makes sense. And I think if, if we did have a sort of a limited list of TLDs to choose from, if, uh, for example, whatever happened back in, I think it was 2013, when they added a bunch of new ones, mm -hmm. if that were to happen again, well, then the code would break for exactly. new, new registrants that use those TLDs. But, but, but there's a lot of websites out there, especially if you're a student, where you're in the habit of signing up for free stuff because you have a .edu account. So if you're at a university or a high school that gives you a .edu address or something more local to your own country, um, you might use a regular expression to just make sure that it's an actual student eligible for free software or whatever, so they still have their value, right. certainly. I can make my own uh, coltonogden.edu and uh, get some free, some free stuff. There you go. Um, all programmers, can you possibly add DFAs and FSMs into CS50? Maybe just an introduction. Uh, probably not enough room in the course to integrate those, you think, right? Realistically, no, but that's why we have these live streams and other yeah. forms of seminars and such. I, 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 yeah, I've personally wanted a, a uh, follow-on for a long time. This would be a great, I think regex and these together would make a great lecture, though. Oh, thank you. Yeah. We should, uh, we should we'll think about that a little bit, maybe. Um, can Draw50 print to PDF and add pages to it? Uh, from what I understand, not PDF, but uh, to PNG files, yes. They can, um, yeah. Do, does PDF work? Well, I mean, Draw50 is just a web-based application, so you could literally go to your own browser's file print menu and generate a PDF of it, which would actually work for that's you. True, and speak true. of the devil, Dan, uh, CS50's own Dan Coffey from last week's stream is here to take your feature request. Dan, come on screen. <laughs> Shout out to Dan Coffey. So Dan, we were just asked, can Draw50 print to PDF and add pages to it? And if not, how quickly could you add that feature? <laughs> um, so it could download a PNG at the moment. We could easily do an SVG. Ooh, graphic. thank you. Um, I don't think it would be, well, I don't know. We need, do you need a server side to convert to PDF? Uh, yes, to generate the download trigger, Cause, yeah. Because to generate the um, PNG download, we just change the headers. Yeah, PDFs are annoying. Uh, we might be able to do it, but honestly, using the browser's built-in mechanism is probably the simplest way. Is something broken? Is that what you came in? Uh, I heard that the tablet wasn't working for drawing. So I oh, oh, we just haven't connected it's, it's it. It's disconnected. Oh, that's yeah. okay. I disconnected yeah. to get the stream set up. It had all the other stuff hooked into it. Functional, I'm sure, but not uh, not plugged in. We're just here talking about regular expressions. If you'd like oh. to talk about your favorite features or regular expressions, uh, or character I, classes, or yeah, reverse. Reverse search is always fun. Oh, reverse search. Nice. Yeah. I'm actually okay. not too familiar with that one. I love using just multiple capture groups. It's like the most, to get everything you need in one search. What a perfect easy. segue to do capture wanna, groups. Do you want to segue? <laughs> so yeah, it turns out that we've been using these patterns thus far to just check whether or not the string matches a pattern. But sometimes you want to extract information from strings. You could use split as we started. You could use substring. But you could also use what Dan described just a moment ago is, as capture groups. And a little confusingly, they too tend to use parentheses. Uh, but we'll distinguish exactly what's going on here as follows. So, how do we go about doing this? So it turns out, suppose that we wanted to ask the question, are you from Harvard or are you from Yale, and did you type in your email address? Well, let me rewind to a simpler regex, which is where we, be, where we were before. It turns out that every time we use parentheses in this way, we are using what's called a capture group, where we are telling the library, the RE library in this case, go ahead and capture those substrings for us. So don't just match on them, but allow me to do something interesting with them. So we can't quite see this now because we are treating the 
return value of re search as being a boolean, which it's technically not. It's actually going to return to us a list that's empty if there's no match or is non-empty if there are matches. So let me go ahead and do this and say matches gets re search, and then the equivalent code would just be matches. So I've not done anything new or interesting just yet. Let me get rid of the colon at the end there. But now I'm actually storing the return value. Let's just poke around and see what Dan was alluding to by printing out those actual matches um, actually only in the case of it being non-null. they exist, yeah. Exactly. So we're going to see thanks for the email and then the actual contents of the return value of re search. Let me go ahead and save that. Go over to our other terminal window and let's go ahead and do mailin at harvard.edu, enter. And you see some interesting fanciness here. And it's not obvious what's inside of that because it's actually a whole object, an object belonging to a certain class called re match. But we can actually check this. Let's go to Python, uh, Python 3. RE um, search, and let's see if we can find ourselves to the capture groups. Let me search for capturing group. Let's see, not on that page. Let's do RE capture group to find the right documentation, just so folks can consult it later. Uh, we use search because that searches any of the part of the string. Oh, you don't see him, but Dan's still over here, everyone. Also, shout out to Kareem in the chat. Kareem's a dame. Nice to see you, Kareem. So you'll see here a discussion in this link here, which is on docs.python.org slash three slash how to slash regex.html, which is more of a discussion of how to use regular expressions. That parentheses also indicate uh, uh, capture groups. And we can actually use uh, some functions that come back as methods inside of that re match object. That's returned. So what does that actually mean? I'm going to focus on using group as follows. I'm going to go into my code again. And instead of just printing that out, I'm going to go ahead and say, you know what? Let's go ahead and print out the first group that matches one indexed. Okay. And let's see what happens. I'm going to go ahead and save that, reload my program, type in mailin uh, at harvard.edu, enter. And we see none came back there, which is interesting. But that's OK. Let's, let's poke around a little further. Let's look at the second group, not one, but two. Let's go ahead and run this again, mailin at harvard.edu. Interesting. OK. So why do you think we've captured Harvard the second time, but nothing the first time? What's the capture group over? It looks like the CS50, right? The and you didn't. Uh, it was a Harvard.edu without a without a subdomain. Exactly. So there was no subdomain. Right. So because in my regular expression I have two sets of parentheses, aka capture groups, as Dan called them. This one in parentheses actually captures either CS50 dot or nothing at all, because the question mark can mean 0 or 1. The second group of parentheses here captures Harvard or Yale. Because both of the parentheses are there, I'm going to get back group 1 and group 2. It's just one of them might actually be none if CS50 dot is not actually present. So I could now do something more conditionally. I could do something like this. If matches.group2 equals equals Harvard, I could say something more precisely like, thanks for the Harvard email. Else I could say something more like, print thanks for the Yale email, just thereby distinguishing the type of email address I got back. And we can appreciate just how much complexity in terms of the iterative logic or the imperative logic that we would have had to incur to get to this point here. Absolutely, indeed. So let's go ahead and do this. So let me go ahead and uh, rerun this program once more, mailin at harvard.edu. Ah, thanks for the Harvard email. But notice we're still supporting CS50. Thanks for the Harvard.edu email. But if I go to Yale's email address, now I've distinguished these two. So the capture group, as Dan referred to, it is a perfect name because you're capturing some part of the substring. You're being handed it back. And in Python, you get at that value by using the group method. And zero is the whole string, right? Zero is going to be the whole string, which is why I deliberately started at one index. It tends not to be that useful. Uh, but it does ensure that if there's a match, it's going to the, the list is going to be non-empty, sure. which is handy. So what if I didn't care about the CS50? I was using the parentheses because I wanted them, but I actually don't want to capture those specifically, it turns out that we can actually tell uh, Python not use these parentheses for grouping and to actually have or not have CS50 dot there. But I don't necessarily have to specify um, that they want to, they're going to be in the capture group. Is this Python syntax, uh, regex syntax specific in this case? It is. So it, you can think of this as the ternary operator, where in C Got and it. in other languages, you can use a question mark, then a colon to say if or else. You can also use that as syntax. It's crazy ugly looking here. But what this is going to do is as follows. Let me go ahead and save this. 
Now let me change the group to one because it's now going to allow me to use parentheses to say zero or one instances of CS50 dot, but it's not going to return them as a capture group. So I'm using them syntactically, but not to capture as Dan proposed earlier. So let me go ahead and rerun this, mainland at harvard.edu, and voila, still detecting, and we're just not unnecessarily capturing stuff we don't want. Yeah. But again, I can't emphasize enough. I mean, this looks like a train wreck of syntax now. It's just so confusing, certainly if you're new to regular expressions, but the key is that we started, you know, what, 90 minutes ago building up with just looking for the at sign, then looking for the username, then looking for the TLD. Really take these baby steps and make your use of regexes really incremental. Yeah, and I think once you've looked at it a few times, um, or in a few of them, like this kind of stuff no longer really seems too intimidating. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Could definitely compare to the monstrous block of code you would need to, to do the same thing, right? Indeed. Without it. Now, it turns out we can do this way more simply by not doing any of this at all. And if I Google Python validate email address, you'll see, as someone mentioned in the um, documentation a, a bit ago, there's actually libraries that will allow you to do this quite simply. So if you actually use pip or pip3 to install validate email, you can really simplify your life by just saying this. So you can ignore this entire conversation about validating email addresses, for instance, and just use a library. But you're assuming that that library is correct. And hopefully it is, it is if it's open source and lots of people have commented on it and provided uh, um, feedback and pull requests to the repo. Um, but this is generally the way to do things, not to reinvent the wheel yourself. So the TLDR for today's stream is download the library for it? <laughs> for email addresses, yes. But regular expressions are so much more powerful, right? Because if suppose you just have a messy data set, right? Humans are in the habit of typing their mailing address addresses differently, their phone numbers differently, you can actually use the symbology that we introduced today in regular expressions to get rid of maybe all of the parentheses, all of the dashes in a phone number so that you're left with just the decimal digits. Uh, you can do this to clean up street addresses. If someone typed in 33 Oxford Street, Cambridge, Mass, 02138, all on one line, you could use regular expressions to extract the state maybe, then hopefully the city, maybe the street address, and with high probability maybe clean it up ultimately too. So that for, one sounds like it'd be a little rough. It is, it is. So better to ask the user from the get-go, what's your street address, what's your city and state? That's probably why they do it in separate fields in most forms. Absolutely. But these days too, if you need to clean up data, which is not uncommon, if you're inheriting data set, if you're doing something data science-y, if you've just got a messy data set from another company or a colleague, you can clean it up using regular expressions by just matching or massaging the data the way you want it to be. Awesome. Should we see if there's any other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was awesome. So uh, also shout out to Again. Brian Rodriguez for the follow. Thank you very much. Uh, oh no. What is it? Sure. Yeah. I think all programmers is asking. Can you talk a bit about the complexity? And he's referring to time complexity of using uh, the regexes. Oh, the time complexity. You can come up with very perverse regular expressions that are incredibly expensive to use. I am not uh, savvy enough to be able to cite a few such examples offhand, to be honest, because it's been some time since I had to think about this. Um, for the most part, you don't have to worry about this, at least for reasonably reasonable length uh, regular expressions like the ones we have been doing here. Um, honestly, uh, rule of thumb is if it kind of fits on the screen and my font size is pretty big, you're probably fine. It's only when you start using lots of capture groups, lots of look ahead, which is not a topic we've looked at today, where things can get computationally more expensive because at some point you introduce a bit of non-determinism and you need to figure out what transition to follow because the state machine you've implied with your regular expression uh, just becomes a lot harder to uh, execute. Awesome. Parset was saying you can use Python 3-i, uh, which will leave the Python process live so you can continue testing. He was True. Saying. Um, group one's whole group. Group two is uh, uh, the open parentheses is Babic Knight. Yeah, I think that's what we mentioned earlier. Uh, Brian Rodriguez says, question for both Colton and Professor Malin. I'm in the process of making a video course for people at work to take independently. Uh, since both of you have done this with great success, do you have any tips or advice? Hmm. Um, it's very uh, tips or advice. Um, I think you want to make sure you know your audience and you don't want to teach or introduce the material at such a high level that your more uh, technical colleagues are kind of bored with it. I think you want to be careful not to speak at too sophisticated a level technically that your less comfortable colleagues are sort of lost by it. So I would try to find that balance and a, a technique we have adopted at least here on campus is to have 
material and problems and questions for those less comfortable and more comfortable. So you introduce the sort of standard set of material, but you allow the more comfortable colleagues to dive in deeper and the less comfortable people to remain comfortable with uh, whatever questions or exercises you're actually challenging them with. The scaffolding that someone alluded to previously in the chat. So that's another good one too. And, and hopefully this came across with what we were doing today. We've got you know a fairly sophisticated regular expression on the screen now, a bunch of conditional logic. We didn't start with that. The very uh, first lines we wrote today were calling input, storing it in a variable, and just printing it out. And so that was an example, albeit a short one, of scaffolding. Start here, and then go here, and here, and here, and here. And hopefully, if your audience is following along in the way, they end up on the top floor, even though you started with them at the base. Exactly, exactly. Totally agree. Um, but before I get lots of hair gel, says Asley, uh, if he's going to start a stream, OK. Uh, uh, Fatma, would regex be uh, used for interpreting regular, uh, regular messages? how Google scans our emails, et cetera. So I guess for parsing email, the bodies of emails. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it depends what you mean by this. But if Google or other companies are searching for keywords, they could be using regular expressions. They might just be using simple string matching. But it's probably implemented in regular expressions, though they do it on such volume that they might need to be fancier than just using, say, Python regexes for performance's sake. Spam filtering type of thing. Spam, yeah, that's another good one. Yeah. Um, I was making a simple compiler for a course of mine, and I used regexes for removing the comments. Yeah, that's a good one, too. And actually, we had some code years ago where in CS50, I tend to write examples for lecture that have comments. Unfortunately, if I show those examples in class, it kind of spoils the questions I'm asking. Because if I ask students, all right, what does this line of code do? The problem is if the comment is right there, they uh, don't have to think too hard about it. So I used to run a command that used a regular expression to get rid of all of the comments, just as you proposed right before class. I did that on accident for a lecture for games during the summer. Oh, but and yeah, there, like, before you lost all your like comments? Kind of a point of fact. Yeah, well, thereby I was a little bit care more careful with <laughs> how clear my comments were. Good thing were. there's version control. Like, <laughs> which brings us to our Git uh, gets, uh, stream, too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kareem Zidane and I did, uh, Kareem host or led the GitHub stream that we did. Also, I missed it. Brutus uh, Harvinius, thank you for the follow. Um, is there a way of capturing multiple occurrences of substrings that match a string? Uh, multiple occurrences of substrings. So uh, if you have a, a, I'm guessing if you have a line of text, it's like hello, 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 um, capturing the same one multiple times. I'm guessing. Yes. Uh, usually you have to use another function, and I don't know offhand, so I'm checking Stack Overflow here. Here we go. This is how this is how real programming is done, everybody. <laughs> so yeah, it looks like uh, the RE library has find all, which does exactly as I think you're I've describing. Had to, I've had to use that function for something before. I yeah. Now that I see function. it, I think I have too. But when in doubt, Google and see what comes back. But now that you have the right mental model for what these are, you'll find that the syntax is going to be pretty much on point to today's discussion. Yeah. Exactly. Um, Yale rhymes with email. Harvard does not. Further proof that Yale is better than Harvard, says Blue Booger. OK, we'll let them know. <laughs> uh, I think you have, might have seen, though, earlier, you mentioned randomness. And I inquired if it is accurate that true short randomness can be incorporated in CS by detection of the noise at the time. So short answer, yes. This is the closest approximation that computers tend to have these days for true randomness, where you take in ambient sound, temperature, movement, things that really are not tied to something very deterministic like a computer's clock. Um, even then, there's certainly periodicity in like the wind, I presume. I am no expert on wind, but things like that. So just taking ambient noise and environment data might not necessarily be truly random. Um, the best we typically can do with computers is, uh, is find a distribution of information that appears Appears to be random, um, but physical inputs are the closest we can get. Cool, makes sense. Um, Homeline says that is still a C to the PRNG, the pseudo random number generator. Mm -hmm. Yep. Never comment your code. Problem solved. There you go. <laughs> All right, I think that's the uh, end of the comments. I don't know if you maybe want to stick around for a couple minutes just to get some last questions, yeah. but that was an awesome, awesome tutorial on regular expressions. Yeah, and I think Dan, uh, CSFT's own Dan Coffey, is about to pop back in with some tips for next steps so that if you'd like to practice with this and learn more, you have uh, some, some tools to use. Um, I just wanted to share one tool that I found game changing when I was exploring regular, regular expressions. Um, and if you want to just Google um, Regex Tester, I think it's Regex Pal or Regex 101. It's Regex Pal, right? Yeah, Regex either Pal. one of this one, the first one, Regex 101 is great. Um, and so you can, if you want to copy paste your, your uh, regular expression into here, the, yeah, the, the ternary one might not work if it's Python specific. Uh, it's, it's not. No, oh, it's, it's not? not? Oh, okay. And then you can put all the cases you want to try to test against down here. So you can do a bunch of emails. Ooh, and, and it shows, it shows you the capture, capture group. It's being captured in. That's amazing. It's a match. And it also will explain 
on the right, um, what the actual breakdown in the top right here explanation. That is um, awesome. Which is under the chat, but. Why is the second one, oh, just to, is it just a different color every other line? The blue? Yeah. Okay. Because you've got the, the global modifiers on at the moment, so. Okay. This is awesome. So here, let me zoom in on the address for everyone online. This is regex101.com. Brought to you today by <laughs> CS50. Yeah, but very helpful is like, you know, you're like, what, instead of having to like constantly keep testing in your terminal window, but yeah. just quickly to see um, what matches, this was helpful for me. Yeah, and you'll see here, we're actually using the PHP flavor of this. We can switch to Python, though you shouldn't find really any differences versus what we did. You do see here subtly the raw string that we alluded to earlier that just ensures that certain characters uh, don't trip you up when they're not escaped. Um, and you can see JavaScript and Go also has implementations here, too. That's awesome. That's a great tool. So yeah, thanks, thank you so much, Dan Coffey. No problem. Any final questions in the stream here? Uh, we got uh, Irene says, uh, thank you, David. Regexes are brilliant, but always daunting. Building them up little by little makes a lot of sense and makes them much clearer. Absolutely. I think that's by far the biggest takeaway. We only scratched the surface of some of the functionality, though, frankly, I think we probably hit some of the most useful features, yeah. most commonly used. So that should be a pretty powerful technique. Dan's the hero. Thanks, Brenda, for all the all the effort we put into here. <laughs> I used to register my CS50 final project, but now I finally understand what I googled <laughs> up from Stack Overflow. Nice. Glad to hear from MK M. Kloppenberg. Yeah, that was an awesome tutorial. Uh, Twitch, hello world. Since you're teaching an HLS course, is it just me or is regex really similar to the old school Lexis and Westlaw search terms using uh, star, uh, bang, etc., and how you think of the terms to search? You know, I don't know if there's a connection between tools like that. Something tells me no, maybe, though star has historically historically tended to mean a wildcard character. Um, exclamation point less has less of a history, I think. So I don't know. I would I honestly pull up the Wikipedia my article myself on both of those uh, to see what their etymology is of their syntax. Uh, uh, Fetz and Randy, uh, Fetz and, uh, Fetz and Randy has followed. Thank you very much. Um, David, would you use Python for Redix nowadays, or would you ever go to Perl nowadays, says Andre. Uh, personally, no. I mean, per, uh, PHP and Python essentially inherited Perl syntax for regular expressions, I believe. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's uh, some of the etymology there. Um, and PC, I, I think that's even PCRE. What does that stand for again? Uh, Perl compatible regular expressions. And I think Python 2 essentially adopted the same syntax, maybe with slightly di slight differences. Um, Perl is actually the first uh, interpreted language that I learned years ago. It's the first language I learned web programming in. Frankly, it's, it's fallen out of favor. Uh, people still use it. Scripts still exist in it. Uh, it's not a language I would typically reach for. Frankly, I think it's very easy in Perl to write code that you yourself don't understand the next day uh, or weeks later. I think PHP and Ruby and, well, PHP and Python have done a better job at readability. Ruby is perhaps a little reminiscent in my mind of Perl and its syntax. So personally, nah, I wouldn't really pick up Perl. You can use its Perl compatible regular expressions in bunches of languages. Uh, are regex still considered slow as in performance as homeline? Uh, it depends on how complicated they are. Someone in the chat alluded to look ahead earlier. There are ways to make them, uh, to over engineer them such that they are so complicated that you do essentially introduce non determinism. The computer has to try this branch or this branch. However, any non deterministic machine can be converted into a deterministic machine. The problem is you might get exponential blow up and just the complexity of it and therefore the runtime. So, short answer yes, but honestly, unless you are using regular expressions to manipulate or uh, pattern match against huge data sets or some data set again and again and again in a loop or many, 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 many times, don't worry about it. Use the regular expression until you find it to be an actual performance problem. Zomu, thank you for the follow. <laughs> uh, let me just go back up here. The chat looks like it's not visible. Thank you for the stream with the happy crying face as all programmers, like a crying face with joy, nice. sort of. Uh, we got another, oh, there's another Zomu on there. Um, Bella says, thank you. Thank you, Bella. Uh, Asley says, Dan's appearance. Thank you so much, David and Colton and Dan. This was very informative and easy to follow. Nice. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, very good intro to Regex is Bavic. Thanks, David and Colton. Thank you. Brenda, this has been great. My Regex knowledge has now grown a lot. Thanks, David and Colton. This is nice. Great. Osman, thank you so much. Took CS50X in 2013. Until now, I can't get enough of CS50. Nice. And I think Brenda also said she took CS50X in 2012. She says, we're oldies. I think I first looked at it in 2010. So that puts oh, me, that puts Brenda, me, just one up to you. That puts me up there. I think Dan, Dan Coffey, uh, also uh, took it in 2012. 2010, 10. Right? 2010 Damn. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's right. Dan was my colleague in 2012. If someone very experienced in AI suggested I not, I not wait to learn it and instead seek and take funding for an app, I think I could eventually code a simple MVP. And other full iterations that don't know how to code AI. Do you agree with Paul Graham? It's not a good idea to start. To, do you agree with Paul Graham that it's not a good idea to start a tech startup if you don't code well enough to select and know if your tech programmers are coding well? Um, I think there are many examples of folks who have started companies who don't necessarily know how to code well themselves. Um, Apple? I, I mean, Apple and even Bill Gates very quickly stopped writing code uh, after, shortly after founding Microsoft, is my understanding. So while I do think there's some guidance to be taken from comments and sentiments like that, where the reality is you will have a leg up if you can just better understand what your team members are doing and what your colleagues are doing. You can hold your own in a conversation. You can participate in the conversation. You can provide input and to provide better direction. I think uh, different people have different skills, and you certainly shouldn't not do something Thing just because you think you're not as strong as someone else in it. No hard, fast rules, just be sensible, basically. Yeah, indeed. Uh, okay, that looks like we caught up with all the comments. Thank you so, so much, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks to David for his awesome regex tutorial. Thanks to Dan for his pop-ins today. And Dan, yeah, for his for his uh, for his contribution. Um, tomorrow we have a super secret stream that we're not going to spoil. Oh yeah, hear good things about this one. Tomorrow, this one's going to be great. Tune in for that one. Um, David and I will be here for that one tomorrow at 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Eastern time. So yeah, no spoilers. 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So thanks again, everybody, so much. Uh, Final word, closing word. This was CS50 on Twitch.